Well, welcome everybody. I'm delighted to have such a good audience from around the world to join us for this webinar. This is one of a series of updates, advances in medicine, which has been brought to you by UK Medical Society, the Fellowship of Postgraduate Medicine. We've been around for over a hundred years. We published two journals, one on health policy and one the Postgraduate Medical Journal broadly on medical education for people around the world. We also welcome members of the public and patients who are interested in the topics which we are covering. Uh, today's session considers aspects of COVID-19. It's been around at least since November 2019. The initial great interest was in this as a virus affecting the lungs, but we now know it affects many parts of the body, including the heart, um, the arteries, uh, kidneys and elsewhere. And today we're going to deal with some information which is emerging on aspects affecting nerves and brain from the COVID-19 virus in the short term and long term. I'm delighted to have two experts with us, uh, Tim Nicholson, who's based at King's College London, and Dr. Ben Michael, who is based at the University of Liverpool. What we're going to do is have presentation initially on the neurological aspects of COVID-19 from Ben Michael, a Q&A, and then we'll go on to the psychiatric aspects uh, with Tim Nicholson, a Q&A afterwards. Because we've got such a large audience, we've got around 400 already registered and more I think, coming in. What we have to do, I think, just to manage that is ask you to use the chat and we'll aim to deal with as many questions as we can, but clearly within our time, we can only do what we can do. Anyway, welcome all. And without more ado, I'll hand you over to Dr. Ben Michael to consider neurological aspects of COVID-19. Good afternoon. Hello, everyone. Uh, it's an absolute pleasure to talk to you on this topic um, and, uh, I, and many, many thanks in advance, uh, both uh, to the faculty, but also to uh, the, the great uh, large number of colleagues who've been involved in this work. Um, I think it was uh, possibly the 23rd of March uh, last year when I first uh, did a similar webinar on the effects of COVID-19 in the brain. And I think uh, now as then, it is appropriate to begin with a slide of uh, Constantine von Economo because uh, much like von Economo, I feel like no matter how hard we've been working over these last 14 months, much of our research uh, raises many more questions uh, than it answers, uh, much like it did uh, 100 years ago in the, uh, the 1918 Spanish influenza uh, pandemic. Of course, many of us were expecting there would be brain complications of COVID-19 right from, from the get-go. And in fact, I was uh, part of a team that were prospectively evaluating the effects of the last big uh, pandemic, H1N1, uh, on the brain. And we ran a prospective study through the UK's professional neuroscience body, the Association of British Neurologists, over two years and identified 25 cases, 21 of whom were children, uh, all of whom were positive for the virus within their respiratory samples, and none of them in their cerebrospinal fluid. The vast majority were children presenting with encephalopathy or encephalitis, and a smaller number of encephalopathy and encephalitis and, and one case of a, a peripheral nerve disorder uh, in adults. But despite this being a, a two-year study uh, and a UK-wide study, really quite small numbers of patients, but nevertheless important, and we were alert to it. And many of us were thinking at the beginning of the pandemic, whether the virus might enter the brain through a breakdown in the blood-brain barrier or through it boosting aspects of the immune system, whether that's a para-infectious cytokine-mediated uh, immune storm, or whether that's a post-infectious autoantibody-mediated disorder, or whether there might be even direct viral infection. Uh, but I think many of us haven't quite anticipated uh, this effect of the virus on the endothelium as uh, as Dr. Singer has, has introduced. Um, but we now realize that there are varying aspects depending on the patient uh, in which dis different pathophysiology can be involved. We recognize now that 70 to 80% of people who are hospitalized with uh, COVID uh, have some sort of neurological symptoms, even if that's just simply headache or myalgia. Up to 10% may have a neurological syndrome, such as encephalopathy, and maybe up to 1% or 2% can have a neurological diagnosis such as uh, stroke uh, or encephalitis. And when we think about the virus or any virus really and the brain and the immune system, we have to try and first establish how likely we think it is that it's actually the pathogen that's causing the problem. And we use two approaches, one uh, 
uh, test based and one epidemiologically based so the test based one uh, is this hierarchy of diagnostic tests in this pyramid on the left so clearly if we identify the organism within the brain or within the intrathecal space or an intrathecal immune response that's highly likely that the path the pathogen is actually pathophysiological and actually that seems to be quite rare for for covid uh, or we identify the organism in a sterile site and an immune response we see some of that but the vast majority of patients we're seeing actually we identify the organism in a non-sterile site so whether that's a nasal swab or a sputum sample uh, but we identify an immune response within the brain so either white cells in the spinal fluid or an evidence of brain inflammation or, or brain blood vessel inflammation and then we think about the arguments for and against there being a causality from a, a Bradford Hill criteria point of view. So uh, the arguments for uh, SARS-CoV-2 causing brain complications are that it seems to be relatively consistent. You know, we've seen this across multiple countries and multiple continents. It seems, seems to have a temporal association with the infection. It's certainly bi both biologically plausible and coherent with our current understanding of the effect of uh, viruses on the brain. Uh, there's a little experimental evidence and it's certainly analogous but there are also arguments against the virus actually having a specific effect against the brain certainly the strength uh, of the association is not strong whatsoever i mean many hundreds of thousands if not millions of people will be infected with the virus uh, without uh, significant numbers having a brain complication it's also not specific you know we've seen this with h1n1 we've seen it with uh, mers and with the first sars pandemic um, and the experimental evidence is in both columns because uh, the murine models in which we study this uh, require specifically genetically engineered mice such as the, ha uh, the AC2 uh, transgenic mice uh, and also particular inoculum to uh, establish a disease model which is not necessarily uh, congruent with what we see in uh, post-mortem tissue. So it's a complex area and um, it's been an absolute delight to work with Tim Nicholson and others across uh, the, the brain-mind spectrum through the coroner studies group, which we set up in, in February last year. And this is a collaboration of basically all the UK's professional neuroscience bodies, whether it's the, uh, the adult or the paediatric um, neurological associations, uh, our colleagues in acute medicine, uh, it's the British uh, Association of Stroke Physicians, or our colleagues in ITUs, the Neuroanesthesia Critical Care Society, uh, and, uh, and Tim here you see, along with the Royal College of Psychiatry, team and our patient and public involvement group, uh, which really was a, a genuinely a, a proper brain-mind consortium, um, uh, which is now expanded to our, to our global partners. Um, what we did was we set up very, very early on in the pandemic, a, a reporting system in which uh, we could get basic data, mainly about the doctor, but a little bit about the patients they were seeing in terms of uh, how confident they were the patient had SARS-CoV-2, and which of the a priori clinical case definitions the patients uh, fell into. Um, our first publication um, was uh, on a preprint in May and about this time last year, in fact, wasn't it? Gosh, uh, and then and published in print in June uh, in the Lancet Psychiatry of the UK's first 153 patients. I um, mean, if you, if you didn't see the publication, you might have seen some of the, the public media coverage. And, and really it was a, a wonderful uh, thing to see the UK really driving uh, awareness of, of these complications um, and because we got up and running so early we were able to capture patients uh, with uh, brain complications of COVID from genuinely from across the UK uh, largely reflecting the geography of uh, generalized hospital COVID uh, cases and also because we mobilized so early we were able to prospectively recruit patients uh, during the exponential phase of the first wave of the pandemic uh, the blue line on this graph being hospitalized COVID and the red line being uh, uh, COVID and brain complications identified through our study, uh, largely tracking each other. Um, I won't go into the, to the details of these first 153 because there's more uh, up-to-date data to share, but suffice to say, our early data showed that about two thirds had a cerebrovascular event, a stroke-like event, uh, about a third had alteration in their mental state, and then there were smaller groups of others. And, and what's been um, gratifying is that um, although we were fast, uh, these data have not been uh, disproved. In fact, they've been corroborated by other studies from uh, Europe, um, Oceania and, and, and North America. Our cases were largely similar to uh, the general hospitalised COVID cases. Um, 
in blue in terms of their age. But what's really, really interesting, and Tim will speak to this more, is that whilst cerebrovascular events occurred in all age groups they, in blue here, they had this predominance for the older uh, age groups, whereas neuropsychiatric uh, cases and altered mental status cases, again, whilst occurring at all ages, had this predominance in the younger group here in red, with uh, about 50% of the cohort uh, being under the age of 60, and just over a quarter being in their 20s, 30s and 40s, uh, really highlighting that this COVID-19, uh, when it comes to the brain at least, is not uh, simply a disease of older people. Uh, we've gone on to look at the notification level data we have um, in the cohort close to uh, 800 patients now, not that 153 original group, but now nearly 800. And we've looked at the temporal distribution of the first 511 through the first pandemic. Um, and what we found was that uh, when one compares just hospitalized COVID in the light gray, so this is the, the sharp exponential peak uh, and then the tail of hospital admissions, when one compares the neurological complications, uh, primarily stroke and altered mental state, so stroke here ends up at the beginning being the vast majority of cases of which we're notified. And in fact, as the first wave declines, uh, notification of stroke cases declines also. Uh, whereas conversely, actually the uh, proportion of cases with alterations in mental status uh, has rose throughout the first wave of that pandemic. Uh, this might reflect reporting bias, uh, of course, but it might also tell us something about um, pathophysiology when we think about the temporal kinetics of infection and uh, the impacts on the brain. But of course, this is very basic surveillance level, notification level data. Um, so we reached out to all the physicians that uh, told us they'd seen a case and asked them to submit uh, anonymous, detailed, granular clinical information on their patients. And this paper is now uh, available as a preprint, but also post peer review in, in one of the brain journals. And we got really detailed clinical data on 267 cases. Uh, about a third were female, uh, uh, about one in five were from uh, black, Asian and minority ethnic groups. Uh, and just under half were under the age of 60. And using the WHO clinical case definitions, um, COVID-19 was either confirmed or probable uh, in the vast majority. And they had the, the standard uh, uh, systemic features such as cough and fever, et cetera, that you would might, might expect. Uh, we classified cases first neuroanatomically and then by pathophysiology. So in, in terms of these 267, uh, the, the vast majority, 226, had a, a central a CNS uh, complication, uh, only a, a relatively small number with peripheral complications. And again, uh, the majority cerebrovascular uh, and then CNS inflammation, delirium and psych psychiatric disorders, which Tim will discuss. I would like to highlight one of the main findings, which is that um, when we look at the time from respiratory symptom onset to the onset of neurological or psychiatric symptoms, cerebrovascular events by and large tended to occur at or around the time of respiratory symptom onset, whereas central inflammatory, psychiatric and peripheral neuropathic presentations occurred statistically significantly later uh, with a median of approximately two weeks after the onset of respiratory symptoms, uh, perhaps suggesting that uh, there is, are, are different pathophysiological mechanisms at play in these, these para and post-infectious phenomena such as CNS inflammation uh, as opposed to the, uh, the cerebrovascular events. And absolutely crucially, a quarter of patients in our cohort presented after their respiratory symptoms had improved and about a quarter presented with neurological or psychiatric symptoms prior to the onset uh, of respiratory symptoms, uh, really highlighting the importance of screening for SARS-CoV-2 infection uh, or evidence of recent infection um, in patients presenting with neurological and psychiatric presentations, uh, as is highlighted in the WHO guidelines published recently, um, which we, we, uh, we helped uh, to produce. So within these 267 cases, um, there is this large uh, and important psychiatric group, which uh, Tim will speak to. Um, but I would like to just flag up that uh, in addition to uh, the, the sort of primary psychiatric cases, there was these real overlapping syndromes of people with um, psychiatric symptoms and signs, but also central inflammatory disorders or delirium or cerebrovascular events. And when one considers these uh, overlapping groups, uh, they actually were much more likely to require intensive care uh, 
65% uh, of the, the overlappers, for want of a better term, versus 26% required intensive care, and uh, they're much more likely to require ventilation, so 71% versus 28% of those with a singular primary diagnosis. Uh, reflecting the complexity of the brain-mind interface um, in any of these complex diseases, but particularly uh, brought to the fore uh, in the context of COVID-19. And really this has uh, helped uh, support a, a growing interest in the field of not just the virus and the blood-brain barrier and the cytokines and the antibodies that I've mentioned, uh, but also the, the aspects of, uh, of the effects of the acute stress response to pandemic anxiety, um, depression, isolation, uh, being hospitalized in a pandemic with doctors in full PPE with a sense that they don't quite know um, uh, how best to treat you and also with, with no visitors, of course, as well. Um, and just finally to, to focus on two of the main groups, the cerebrovascular group and the severe encephalopathy group, just because they were the most uh, common and most complex respectively. We identified this phenomenon which had been uh, reported anecdotally, but we have shown to be, a, be a, a, you know, really a, quite a clear phenomenon is, um, is severe encephalopathy not meeting the criteria for delirium. So uh, in early 2020, the uh, 10 societies largely from Europe and North America produced a, a guideline about defining delirium. Um, and these cases we identified with COVID actually are beyond what would be considered delirium. They have se severely reduced levels of arousal, often with cardiac or renal complications, including cardiac arrest. And then seizures, and the seizures were two groups, firstly, a group of older adults who had pre-existing neurological comorbidities but that were then uh, tipped over the balance of their seizure threshold uh, in the context of COVID. Uh, but crucially, this group here in yellow of seizures and status epilepticus uh, often occurring in younger patients and often without uh, any pre-morbid conditions whatsoever, uh, which you know it, it, it at least is interesting for the possibility of a an autoantibody uh, that's directed against uh, CNS antigens, um, such as has been described with the LGI-1 and NMDIR receptor antibodies following COVID. And overall, these patients were younger and had higher in-hospital resource utilization, including duration of ventilation and intensive care. So an important group requiring work. And um, what's really important is that for so much of the pandemic, we've not been able to perform MRI brain scans uh, because of uh, the patients being too sick, the stretched resources, and also the risks of uh, transporting infected patients around the hospital uh, and uh, sanitizing MRI units. But in those areas where they have, including this study in, in America and another study in Italy, when these patients do get an MRI scan, some of them have had a leukoencephalopathy, shown here in the white on the T2 flare. Uh, some have got acute necrotizing encephalopathy, acute demyelinating encephalomyelitis, uh, limbic encephalitis or, or other inflammatory changes in the brain and uh, from this uh, study led by a colleague Alessandro Padovani from Italy um, it, nearly half of their patients who were encephalopathic off the ventilator uh, had some sort of MRI change uh, which is potentially causative. So moving on to the strokes given they were the most common group um, about a quarter so 35 of our patients were under the age of 60 Interestingly, they presented on an average 10 days after respiratory symptom onset, as opposed to the older patients who presented at or around the time of uh, their COVID symptoms. Uh, comorbidities were more common in the older group, but even two thirds of the younger group had some sort of cardiovascular comorbidity. The younger group were twice as likely, so 31% uh, had multi-vessel uh, thrombosis within the brain and 18 as opposed to 8% of the younger patients actually had thrombosis outside of the brain as well. And we compared not just uh, our stroke patients to the other COVID patients, but we compared them to a group captured through the National Stroke Audit through the same months, but in 2019. Um, and that's a normal, as it were, non-COVID strokes in grey and our cohort in red. And here you can see normally 20% of strokes were under the age of 60 whereas the COVID strokes over 40% were under the age of 60. But despite being younger and despite having uh, non-CNS thrombosis as well, so thrombosis in the pulmonary arteries, the, in, within the heart and within the renal arteries, uh, 
uh, so all unusual for stroke, uh, they had some usual factors, including having multiple uh, conventional cardiovascular risk factors and cerebrovascular risk factors, such as uh, congestive heart failure, hypertension, diabetes, cerebrovascular disease, and atrial fibrillation. Uh, we looked at multiple factors in terms of predicting outcome, and uh, uh, largely it was uh, age and clinical frailty uh, prior to requiring COVID, uh, acquiring COVID, which predicted poor outcome regardless of your of your diagnosis. Uh, really highlighting the importance of the vaccine program uh, and reinforcing, in fact, uh, uh, the strategy for focusing on age and frailty, uh, as we have done in so many studies. But there remain a great many questions, and I'm delighted that the UK or IMRC have funded uh, myself and Jerome Breen at KCL as co-PIs uh, leading the, the COVID clinical neuroscience study, COVID-CNS, uh, in which we are intending to establish really in detail the clinical characteristics of these patients and the role of routine biomarkers in predicting disease severity and outcome. We seek within this study through 1,300 patients to identify the underlying pathogenesis using virologic and immunologic techniques and to determine the role of biomarkers both at a structural and functional MRI level uh, but also at a brain injury uh, blood level uh, parameters in terms of predicting uh, disease severity, the nature of the complication and its sequelae, and what we shall do in this severely affected hospitalised phenotype cohort is determine whether similar but milder complications exist in community cases uh, through the already funded NIHR bioresource with the overarching hypothesis that if we combine markers of CNS inflammation, injury and genetic risk, we can identify mechanisms of these acute complications and their sequelae so that we can mechanistically stratify patients for therapies. So in conclusion, uh, COVID-19 clearly is associated with a broad spectrum of brain and mind complications throughout the nervous system. Uh, and the UK has been leading the way in describing these. Uh, our, the outcomes vary between the disease groups, but are largely influenced by your pre-COVID status. We've identified two really important groups. One, a severe encephalopathy, often associated with requiring intensive care, ventilation and, and uh, having seizures and also a large and multi-vessel stroke cohort, often in younger people, and often with thrombosis, not just in the brain, but in multiple organs, organs around the body, which requires further study. But that despite the unusual nature of COVID's effects on the vascular trigger, conventional and often modifiable risk factors seem to be associated. And if this is proven in other studies, there is a huge potential for a public health intervention to control things such as diabetes and hypertension. And our hope is that bringing this clinical data together along with biomarker and neuroimaging data, we can actually stratify patients to either existing or novel therapeutic options uh, for a third or fourth wave we might face, but of course for uh, the many countries around the world which are uh, still very much uh, in the middle, if not the early phases of, of uh, dealing with this pandemic. Uh, whilst there remain a great many unanswered questions, uh, I'm confident that working together uh, across neurology, psychiatry and psychology, and across basic and clinical sciences as we have done, uh, and across the, the globe with our WHO colleagues. Um, unlike Von Economo, where we first started, uh, we might actually working together finally answer these questions. I'd just like to close by thanking the COVID CNS team of RAs uh, and uh, fellows, to thank my postdocs, my PhD students and uh, academic clinical fellows, to thank my NeuroAccess NeuroPaces team uh, and to thank the Coronary Studies Group uh, and in particular Tim Nicholson and colleagues uh, where this all began just over a year ago. And, and thank you all for your time. Ben, Dr. Ben Michael, thank you very much indeed for a very clear presentation of some of what we know so far. Um, I think what we've got time for now is a, is a few minutes of questions and I'll add Tim to our screen. You've talked about young people and disproportionate risk in some of those syndromes you've you mentioned. What about um, a question one of the uh, the audience here, children, adolescents, is there much known yet on, on their risk of these neurological syndromes? Yeah, thank you. It's a really important point. And we were right early on to give so much emphasis to older people because of the respiratory complications and, um, and the very high morbidity and mortality in that group. Um, but we are now increasingly recognising the importance, at least, of brain complications in younger people. Um, so the, the coroner studies um, 
uh, we in fact we have a pay I just minutes before this meeting started received the the peer review responses and um, we have a, a paper currently under consideration in Lancet adolescent and child health of just over 50 uh, people under the age of 18 identified through our study with brain complications of COVID um, and they fall into largely two camps firstly those with this um, what's called PIMS TS or pediatric uh, immune mediated inflammatory syndrome temporarily associated to COVID or just PIMS for now, which is a multi-system inflammatory disorder, well described. Uh, but what our study has shown is that in younger people, it's not just PIMS. Half of the patients we recruited actually had a non-PIMS inflammatory disease like uh, acute disseminated encephalomyelitis and limbic encephalitis and other disorders of inflammation of the nervous system. So it, mercifully, it seems very, very rare. Uh, but it's incredibly important when it happens uh, and needs to be need to be caught and treated. Another question is, you mentioned some of the mechanisms appear linked to thrombotic risk, uh, and that raises the question about what, what, what should the policy be in terms of giving some form of anticoagulation as a matter of routine in patients who are, who are apparently high risk from the intensity of the respiratory side of the COVID. And I suppose also that the sub-question there is, what's known about, despite giving what would be conventional anticoagulant treatment do people are people still getting the syndromes is, is is it is it to what extent is this under anticoagulation versus um a more severe syndrome more much more prothrombotic giving rise to the thrombotic syndromes yeah great question um so there is a study currently uh, where patients are being randomized to aspirin so we, we, we await the results of that definitive trial but um what i would caution is that um the, the, it's not just ischemic stroke that we're seeing, we're also seeing hemorrhagic stroke, whether that's a subarachnoid hemorrhage or intracerebral hemorrhage. So I, I, um, it would seem that blanket use of prophylactic antiplatelet agents such as aspirin and clopidogrel probably is not well advised, uh, given the fact that, that both complications are, are possible. And whilst the current stroke guidance is to treat the uh, COVID stroke as one would a standard stroke, um, there does at least appear to be some uh, post-mortem evidence of a, a viral endotheliopathy suggesting that this is this is not conventional uh, pathophysiological mechanisms for stroke so we might need to be a bit more nuanced in our thinking about how we treat it and the other obvious question is you, you mentioned that some of the neurological features seem to be occurring in those with very severe disease uh, coming to ITU or um, needing very severe hospital support but um, there's a, it seems a dissociation between severity and some other syndromes. Is much known as yet within your surveillance on people who've had, say, one vaccine or just into the second, who may still have a milder form of, of the virus, either asymptomatic or, or mild symptoms, and, and to what extent they're still getting some of these neurological features? The vaccines seem to be effective, actually. Um, we've seen dramatic decline in the number of patients reported to the surveillance study. Um, although that being said, we have had some patients who've had the vaccine uh, and within that window of not yet having full immunity, uh, acquiring COVID and then developing a COVID brain complication because of changes in our behaviour once we're vaccinated. So I, th I think that is the next phase is to see what happens at a human level as society opens up, as more and more people get vaccinated, uh, what might be happening. I think you've addressed this in part in, in one of your later tables, looking at uh, relationships between obvious risk factors such as hypertension and so on, and what was happening. And the question here is to what extent patients with diabetes are disproportionately getting these sequelae? Yeah, absolutely. Two things. So yes, diabetes seems to be a risk factor for cerebrovascular events, um, particularly, um, but uh, on, on an even more complicated level, uh, as we've seen in some of the very hard hit countries like India, um, the combination of diabetes plus uh, the, the um, aggressive is not the right word, but the, the enthusiastic use of corticosteroids because of the high morbidity and the lack of intensive care beds has resulted in the diabetes plus steroids plus COVID um, perfect storm of um, opportunistic infection. And many on the call will have heard about mucormycosis, which is a an, an environmental fungus which can cause um, facial, cellulitic and brain infection. And actually many of these patients are dying from the fungal brain infection 
as a consequence of diabetes plus steroids uh, as opposed to, to COVID itself. Um, so yes, I, I think um, our patients with diabetes are ones that deserve particular attention. I suppose it's worth just saying the obvious that uh, at the moment it's important to try to look at relationships and generate some hypotheses, but with multiple subsets with different patterns to the sort of neurological problems you're seeing, you'll need a much bigger data set before you can be confident about individual risk factors and, and these particular subsets. Thank you, yes. And, and, and on that point, um, we, you know, we work very close, both, both Tim and I work very close with the WHO and I co-chair one of these working groups and we are uh, using our data collection platforms uh, across uh, the globe now so that we can synthesize uh, data sets from multiple countries and continents, not just from high, but also from low and middle income settings so that we can really get the sufficient N to, to answer these critical questions. Perhaps just one, one last thing before we move on, Ben. Um, can you say a bit about what the outcomes are as far as they're known in terms of recovery from the syndromes? Yeah, thank you. So we are, I mean, we, we are looking at that in COVID CNS. Uh, we are looking at the psychiatric, the cognitive and the neurological outcomes uh, and what that means um, in terms of one's independence uh, and uh, you know, re returning to work and and, and the, the social and societal aspects of that. Um, I, I think we're, we're too early uh, to, to make concrete uh, conclusions on that. Um, but certainly I, I know from my own experience, patients who've, um, who, who were previously healthy, who've suffered, uh, uh, you know, for example, a, a stroke or, or an encephalopathy and a prolonged ITU period where, um, you know, that there are lasting um, neurological, psychiatric and cognitive consequences and uh, much as we've done in the research in our clinical practice we probably need to come together across the neurosciences to, to support these patients because it's not just uh, psychological or just neurological it's it's right. often both but, but how just to ask a very specific question you, you showed some very clear examples on on where it was possible to do them brain scans mr scans showing white matter damage uh, do they behave in the same way as other sort of white matter damage syndromes do or is it, is it, is it enough data as yet in terms of recovery from these people or, or to what extent can you can you generalize to other syndromes? So we've, done, we've got some pilot data on that already. What we have seen is some degree of a subcortical uh, picture. What one we see with a leukine encephalopathy is subcortical uh, cognitive impairment, so a, a intact cognition but some slowing. But that's, that also can be present in functional neurological disorders as well. Um, so it's only really when we do the structural and functional MRI combined with detailed cognitive assessments that I, I think we'll, we'll really, really get to that. Then once again, thank you very much indeed for your presentation and discussion. I'm delighted to welcome as our next speaker, Dr. Tim Nicholson, who is a clinical senior lecturer in neuropsychiatry at the Institute of Psychiatry at King's College in London. Tim is also honorary secretary of the Fellowship of Postgraduate Medicine, which is organising today's webinar. He will now discuss the neuropsychiatry of COVID-19. Thanks, Donald. Uh, it's a pleasure to talk today and to follow Ben. And it's been a real pleasure of the last year, of, of uh, as Ben has mentioned, about working together across the clinical neurosciences to address uh, what was initially potentially a sort of small but significant issue into what is becoming increasingly big issue uh, of the psychiatry and neuropsychiatry of uh, COVID. Um, my slides aren't moving on, so I'll just, oh, slowly, there we go. So I'll, I'll talk a bit about the, the background of why we think it's important uh, to look at the neuropsychiatry and the psychiatry. Um, a bit more from the psychiatry perspective about the study that you've already heard about this, uh, this great study that was already up and ready and ready to go. Um, and it allowed sort of the UK to sort of really lead the way with, with the surveillance data. Um, and uh, then a bit about uh, uh, and another great thing that's come out of the uh, pandemic has been the uh, a blog team, which has been summarizing at sort of uh, 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 great speed, the, 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 so it's allowing us to keep up with the data that's been emerging in this, this uh, extremely important area. Uh, I'll also talk about long COVID. Um, and I think many people will know about this, but it's, uh, it's becoming perhaps the era defining disorder that's coming out of, of, of uh, of the pandemic. Um, talk a little bit about the end about the neuropsychiatric aspects of vaccines, uh, which I think are important as well. So as Ben mentioned, there was really this sort of, uh, I think the, the sort of anosmia sort of really brought home to people the potential uh, for 
uh, the sort of neurological uh, effects of this disorder. Although, of course, you know, it's the initial concern this might be a route for direct brain infection is much more thought to be a sort of more local effect, but it really got everybody, I think, focused minds a bit on this issue. Um, so there's this potential of neurotropism, uh, and as Ben mentioned, all these different aspects of mechanism from an, uh, an inflammatory immune uh, uh, sort of cytokine storm initially to later autoimmune processes. Um, uh, in psychiatry in particular, and neuropsychiatry as well as neurology, we have to think about treatment-related effects on the brain, so delirium from hypoxia, all the psychiatric consequences of drugs and intensive care uh, treatment. And we have an extra level of complexity within neuropsychiatry and psychiatry and that we have the socioeconomic and environmental effects and how that can drive uh, disorders uh, either created de novo or precipitate people who might be subclinical and a disorder into a clinical presentation. But we also had reasons, as uh, Ben also outlined, about why we should be suspecting perhaps that there might be a, a neuropsychiatric or psychiatric burden. And this is a um, paper that um, was sort of really um, came out in February 20, uh, uh, 2020 um, and had been in brewing, I think, for several years, uh, led by Tom Pollack, a uh, colleague here at, uh, at King's, along with uh, Robin Murray, Bob Yorkin and uh, Johns Hopkins and some other colleagues, really putting together the data from the, um, the Spanish flu that um, Ben highlighted and thinking about the mechanisms of particularly autoimmunity and um, Tom has been leading the way really in thinking about the immunological and biological causes of psychosis, i.e. schizophrenia um, and, and other uh, psychiatric disorders. Um, and I think really just to flag up that the, the, um, the encephalitis lethargica story, uh, of course, which I think uh, Ron Economo that um, uh, Ben mentioned, but also this is a slide from Tom, uh, Pollock, uh, really, that uh, uh, that uh, Carl Menninger uh, back um, back at this this time really started to look at the the influence potentially on psychosis. Um, and this is a sort of interesting uh, slide uh, again of Tom's to just to remind uh, people that uh, that there, there are these different. The, the old term for schizophrenia was dementia precox, so a sort of premature dementia, as it were. Uh, and then there's the delirium, and the delirium would occur early on in the disorder as the, this group of delirium, and then there'd be um, sort of psychotic uh, patients, but this would be sort of initially and then later on. So there might be different causes for different types of presentation. And I think delirium and psychosis I'll come back to later on. Uh, and this is again, just to sort of highlight the importance of von Economo and the, the encephalitis lethargica story. And thankfully we don't seem to have seen something sort of a, a, a sort of movement disorder uh, type uh, a problem, and if it's it, if it is there, it's not at the rates that we perhaps might have seen uh, with with other uh, previous pandemics. Or, although, of course, the, the causal association there is uh, far from secure. Um, and another thing that happened straight away at the beginning of the pandemic is that um, uh, Jonathan Rogers and Ed Chesney at uh, UCL and Kings, together with senior colleagues across both institutions, um, rapidly reviewed the reviewed the psychiatric and neuropsychiatric complications of. Uh, SARS and MERS and the very early data that was almost not really much to talk about back back then. So this was published in May and obviously the search was done very quickly in putting together uh, this data and acutely SARS and MERS causing confusion, memory impairment and insomnia um, in, in sort of around a you know, quarter of it. So this was quite again flagging up, reminding people that there's this data that had been brewing for years about the other severe coronaviruses um, that might be indicating something similar and again you know, quite a lot of this uh, we have a bit more detail now on because we've had so much research attention compared to what SARS and MERS got. Um, and then in the post-illness phase, and this is re perhaps relevant to, uh, to long COVID potentially as well, we'll come back to later on, is that high rates of depression, anxiety disorder, um, PTSD and fatigue. Um, and uh, Jonathan Rogers is a bit of a polymath, and this is a, uh, I, I'll put this in the chat if we have time later on, but this is a, he, he's done a musical abstracts set to the um, Gilbert and Sullivan Pirates of Penzance uh, talking through it. So it's a very novel form of uh, abstract presentation. And uh, I think one of the best, best ones I've seen for a long time. Um, my slides are sticking again, I'm afraid. Just trying to move on. Oh, here we go. So the coronavirus surveillance study. Um, so Ben uh, talked to you about this and it was uh, again with um, Tom Pollack and a bunch of colleagues from the Royal College of Psychiatrists. We set up a psychiatry 
uh, reporting system to bolt on to this uh, brilliant study that uh, uh, Ben and colleagues had already got up and running. Um, and if there are any uh, psychiatrists or people who clinicians who see neuropsychiatric or psychiatric patients, we'd encourage you to submit cases, even for patients you've seen over a year ago, uh, with any of these uh, wide range of syndromes that we might theoretically be interested in thinking could be occurring um, causally related to, to, um, uh, to COVID-19. We're also interested in vaccine reactions as well, and I'll come back to this later on, and also whether it occurs in the perinatal period, which might be uh, important. This is the study that uh, Ben mentioned, the first 153 notifications, so just the, the sort of high level basic detail of these patients. And as Ben said, we had, there's a broad range, and it's quite interesting that we knew this was a sort of non-epidemiological surveillance study, um, and uh, was clearly open to a bunch of reporting biases and other biases, but this, this general mix has been quite interestingly sort of generally, uh, occur, you know, uh, is coming out through, through later data. So a lot of cerebrovascular events, quite a lot of altered mental status, and whether you classify that as neurological through encephalopathy or neuropsychiatric, and then a, a sort of a, a smaller range of other disorders uh, being being reported. Um, and in terms of the, psych the neuropsychiatric, there was a, a sort of significant proportion of psychosis, cognitive impairment, and then a, a mixed bag of other things, but reassuringly not much in terms of catatonia or discrete psychiatric other syndromes, uh, which potentially could have, you know, there could have been some, um, some reasonable speculation that that might be something we'd see. So uh, again, this, this change in uh, age, so how younger patients uh, presenting with neuropsychiatric compared to the so a slightly bimodal peak of, of neuropsychiatric, including as a younger onset group. Uh, and this is the uh, data which uh, uh, Ben showed as well. The, uh, the next study, which is uh, hopefully we published very soon, the preprint's been out for several months, uh, showing the, 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 again, the similar range of spread of presentations, but focusing on the psychiatry here in the center. So there were some exact six exacerbations of existing psychiatric disorders and 19 new syndromes. Uh, and these are the syndromes reported here. So uh, um, psychosis, uh, depression, anxiety, um, and a miscellaneous uh, group of other disorders as well. And as Ben mentioned, we've got this interesting group here where there's an overlap between delirium and psychiatry, uh, psychiatric presentations, so particularly psychosis, as you'd have seen. And, and I think that there's, there was, until we, dug into the full clinical detail, uh, it was unclear whether there were concern, that whether there were valid concerns about whether this was misdiagnosis of delirium as psychosis. But these were um, patients reported by experienced clinicians who could generally sort of uh, uh, realize when there was a different disorder occurring later after delirium or uh, in a clear sensorium and therefore not associated with, with a, sort of gen a, a sort of more generalized or delirious presentation. And this is just in more detail, that same group. And as Ben mentioned, this interesting uh, time difference. And of course, here we've got perhaps different, you know, we're classifying CNS disorders in lots of different ways. But if you, um, these are all more mechanistically driven, but psychiatry is just a group of symptoms. So we, we could expect that we, we should be able to break this up into a bunch of different, if we have enough numbers, into different types of disorder and therefore different mechanisms. So, but it's just uh, uh, importantly noticing this sort of early onset and often preceding the respiratory symptoms. Uh, so just to quickly shout out to the blog team who uh, started off as myself, Matt Butler, Tom Pollock, and a couple of others with support from the uh, Journal of Neurology, Neurosurgery and Psychiatry, as a BMJ group journal, which um, is a sort of leading interdisciplinary journal, um, supported us setting up a blog because we realised that most um, systematic reviews take months and this is a fast moving critical uh, area of research that needed to be summarized quickly. So weekly updates uh, occur on this website and we have our own uh, Twitter uh, handle and page, uh, including some of our uh, growing number of uh, dynamic students and trainees, particularly and senior colleagues, some of whom are master bakers and had this uh, Shrove Tuesday coronavirus pancake, which we've kept as our, our logo. Um, so it's a really impressive team and there's, uh, we're, we're just about to move to, and this is the current website, and in the next week or two we've been building a new website with support from the journal, um, where we're going to have a fully searchable database, a bit like your Amazon storefront, where you can come in wanting the papers on anosmia or 
um, Guillain-Barre syndrome, or you want all RCTs or all cohort studies, and you can come and pick out what you want. So the, the team have been doing amazing work behind the scenes, and this is going to launch quite, quite soon. Uh, we also have I've been invited by Tom Solomon, um, uh, one of Ben's colleagues in Liverpool, sort of leading light in encephalitis and brain infections uh, from a neurology perspective, to give five minute summaries of the top five papers in the last month on these webinars. And there's a back catalogue of those we're putting on our blog website and are also uh, viewable on the Brain Infections Global website, um, which uh, is an a great resource. And I'd encourage you to watch their lectures uh, every month, but also the highlights from our star, the stars of our blog team. I'll just walk you through a few sort of interesting papers I've picked out. There's so much to cover, it's hard to know what, what we can do in a short uh, uh, lecture such as this, but I was going to just pull out a few important papers. I think one is about this, this paper from the uh, Institute of Neurology uh, at UCL, um, really looking at uh, the epidemiology of Guillain-Barre syndrome. So there were initial case reports of Guillain-Barre Syndrome, and as Ben pointed out with that causal relationship paper, it's very hard to tease out association and causation. You need to constantly bear in mind that we might be overly sensitive to picking up things where there's signal, where there's it's just noise, and conversely, we might be falsely reassured and not look hard enough for certain things. But uh, so this was a paper that really started to put some of the question marks alongside uh, the fact that Guillain Barre syndrome was either occurring. In relation to COVID-19, or if it was that it was it wasn't occurring at a, in a huge rate. So, so this was a good a good paper to, to pull out. Um, this is an interesting paper just looking at cytokines, and I guess you know there are there, there, there isn't a huge amount of data, but the COVID CNS study that Ben's leading on uh, will hopefully start to pull out so get us some more information on this. And there are some other studies uh, globally uh, tackling this. So they're looking for the sort of what what is behind this uh, this this uh, what causing these delirium uh, deliriums in patients uh, and 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 the initial uh, sort of uh, inflammatory uh, effects on the brain and this was a paper which really highlighted the, the 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 need to look out for this as a presenting feature in the elderly so not so and it can occur before the respiratory symptoms are uh, either noticeable or uh, have even occurred and really just saying that delirium is something we really need to be very careful of. And I think this is also, there are some opportunities with the pandemic and one of them, delirium is a very neglected disorder that sits at the center of medicine, old age medicine, general medicine, intensive care medicine, neurology, psychiatry, and a whole bunch of other disciplines, but it generally has fallen between the gaps. So it's, it's perhaps a, a time to focus on this complex disorder. Another interesting thing is just to keep us aware for things we might, you know, we, we weren't expecting to see. And this was a, a study that really made a lot of people sit up thinking, looking at the reduced mortality in people taking antidepressants. So a slightly uh, circuitous uh, link between uh, psychiatry and, um, and COVID-19 in the sense that there, and that there was potentially something protective about taking antidepressant in terms of getting severe uh, um, COVID and, and uh, uh, to the point of, um, uh, uh mortality so so i think this is just a and the mechanism of this is being perhaps investigated a bit more now how that might be happening so i think this is interesting um i had put this in because i was a bit worried we forget to talk about children and that was thankfully brought up in the chat and uh ben covered earlier on so this is really just to think about that this isn't just something in adults there are these severe but thankfully quite rare uh, complications that occur in children and adolescents Another critical paper, a really important paper, I think, in the last few months has been this study from Maxine Take in uh, Oxford and other colleagues in Oxford uh, who studied a large uh, data set of electronic notes in the US. Uh, and this looked at uh, hazard ratios across the full range of neurological and psychiatric complications, at least as much as you can do by ICD-10 coding within electronic notes. So if you look for the hazard ratios here, this is comparing to influenza uh, controls and other respiratory tract infections. So it's a huge data set, 236,000 patients. And it, it sort of confirmed things we already knew about strokes that being high hazard ratios, not much to worry about Guillain-Barre, more reassuring data, same for Parkinsonism, as we'd expect, you know, that we're not really seeing from the surveillance side of things much going on in terms of uh, movement disorders. Um, um, interesting finding, which isn't, uh, we've just got a letter which I think has been accepted and we'll, we'll, we'll hopefully make uh, proposing that this is, this was this is something we wouldn't expect from the, from the blog data and the surveillance data, we weren't finding any uh, muscle or mineral junction dis disease, um, but 
we're pretty sure this represents, at least in part, um, a post-ICU uh, myopathy uh, or neuropathy that is occurring as a result of uh, protracted uh, intensive care stay. So this isn't uh, particularly highlighted in the paper, but I think this is our interpretation of it. And I think it'd be interesting to see if there's any counter response from the authors on that. Uh, just a couple of other things to pull out that psychosis. We, were, we haven't been seeing a huge amount of this clinically, and it's obviously hard to disentangle um, causation as mentioned, but that's, uh, this is something that um, uh, there's a bit of a signal there perhaps, and also dementia. So, so we know delirium occurs, but are we, we're a bit worried about potentially, we know that delirium is a harbinger of dementia sometimes, uh, and it's something to be, you know, uh, it can occur in people who are sort of predisposed to or on the way towards developing dementia. So it's really just to keep an eye out for those, those things. Um, and just to go back to our blog team, they've, uh, this is just, this has got to come out in the next few days, but the preprint's been out for a while. This is coming out in GNMP. This is a meta-analysis of the first six months of the pandemic, led by, uh, again, the brilliant Jonathan Rogers, Cam Watson, Ali Rooney, and a huge bunch of the growing team from the blog. Um, this is just to quickly highlight the COVID CNS study that Ben talked about, which has been uh, a brilliant way to look at the data uh, and hopefully give us some mechanistic insights in this, this large uh, transdisciplinary uh, and sort of uh, nationwide study, which uh, has got even more centres than, than listed in this current, current page. So this is where we're at now. Um, we have, you know, as Ben had mentioned, quite a lot of encephalitis and encephalopathy, which can present with psychiatric symptoms. Similarly, the stroke, um, lots of delirium, very common, important, cognitive dysfunction, possibly dementia. And then we also have in the pure psychiatry side of things, we have PTSD, anxiety, depression, and possibly psychosis. This is, it might be soon where this, these brackets get taken off and it, it might be relevant. And then um, just, this is where we're at now, but I think long COVID is something that has quite a lot of neurological symptoms, neuropsychiatric symptoms and psychiatric symptoms, which I'll talk about shortly. Uh, as one of the final things. So this has been a, 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 a really important disorder that's uh, emerged over the last year. It was about this time last year that the first uh, patients were starting to coalesce on, um, uh, on social media and on a, a Slack channel, the Body Politics Slack channel. Um, and we're presenting with uh, uh, chronic symptoms um, where often had not been uh, hospitalized acutely. So there was sort of uh, it was surprising to the patients and the doctors that they, that they had chronic symptoms. And there was often uh, a fatigue, headache, brain fog, but a, a full a wide range of other symptoms. And this is a, 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 a picture from one of the patient groups, the early patient groups, uh, just really summarizing those uh, their symptoms. And this is the, the symptoms uh, by the, uh, the first, uh, and I think it's, this is almost, uh, I think it's a, a key part of the evolution of this disorder was the publication online by the patient-led research team back in May, um, so uh, almost exactly a year ago, the first 640 patients and what their symptoms were. And uh, this was picked up by Ed Young in the Atlantic, and then it went sort of uh, global. And there were at the same time starting to come out some, uh, some uh, studies really looking at sort of uh, uh, organ impairments that occurred in relatively in people with uh, who weren't initially severely ill um, or left with chronic symptoms uh, that were picked up on later imaging. Um, there was a, a sort of campaign to get recognition, uh, both from the press and politicians and uh, the World Health Organization, and this was uh, a, a sort of massive success and it got the world's attention. Uh, this is one of the first papers by Trish Greenhall, academic GP, who many of you will know, really flagging this up because this is something mostly seen in primary care at this point. But this, this sort of a, uh, a great publicity campaign really got um, uh, the politicians' attention and uh, secondary care services were set up rapidly and have now, there's now over 80 planned across the UK. And the second tranche of £20 million pounds funding for, from the UKRI and the NIHR uh, is about to be awarded in the next month. So there's a huge amount of clinical and research attention on this problem. Uh, just to flag up the kids side of it as well, this is something that's not just in adults and there's quite a lot of reports and data coming through that adolescents and younger children can, can be affected by this as well. So this is just a, a summary of the complexities and this is a paper we've uh, had in preparation for a while. Uh, so I'm just trying to grapple with the full range of complexities around long COVID. And there's lots of issues about how long you need the symptoms for, 
um, uh, what, you know, what evidence for infection um, or a clinical syndrome of infection to, is, is necessary. Um, what are the clinical features, both in terms of the symptoms and perhaps the, one of the key markers of this is fluctuating symptoms. It seems to be quite common um, uh, with, within the, uh, the reports we've got. Uh, should patients be classified, subclassified according to initial severity of illness, whether on intensive care, admitted or uh, community uh, based? Uh, um, and then there's the different mechanisms that could be going on. And as Ben, has, these are the same ones that we see across the neurological uh, symptoms, as Ben has highlighted before. So whether it can be vascular, direct invasion of tissues, parainfectious, post-infectious, or a cognitive process that might be driving this. And there could be any combinations of these within a given individual, and of course across uh, what might be a heterogeneous group of disorders. Um, and this is just a slide from our, our paper, which, uh, again, in preparation, just looking at the post-viral syndromes in context about SARS and MERS, we've already talked about, but just to look, to look across the different range of other viruses uh, and which often have very severe chronic uh, syndromes associated with them. So really, what, what is the relationship between these two? And, and, and there's often different features within different viruses and what, what can be explaining that. Just to really pick up on another last few slides is about the uh, this is the, the, the paper which I think will be out soon from Hannah Davis, Athena Akrami and other patients who, uh, um, uh, Athena is a neuroscientist at UCL, and, and this has been again a sort of another uh, huge sort of revolution in that they, they not, from their initial survey, they did a more formal survey of nearly 4,000 international patients, uh, most of whom hadn't been hospitalized and reported their symptoms with large rate, high rates of uh, fatigue, uh, brain fog, cognitive dysfunction, but also neurological symptoms. And I'll just quickly talk you through some of these. Um, so this is just the, uh, the fatigue and post-exertional malaise and other systemic symptoms. Um, but the, uh, these are the neurological symptoms, so a very wide range. And this is something that I don't, I'm not sure if people were completely expecting. And I think this is why uh, neurology, neuropsychiatry and psychiatry colleagues need to sort of get very involved in the research and care of these patients because there's a large number of symptoms that people can present with. So these are the rates of these, this huge range of neurological symptoms, and they're, they're actually uh, one of the most common types of symptoms. Um, and this is putting it together based on the symptoms reported in that study, of how you might have this core sort of cardiorespiratory cognitive brain fog, and then there's a range of other physical and other psychological symptoms which are associated with the condition. Um, and just a final thing from patient-led research, this, this, this caused, uh, this was a, a pay, um, came out in The Guardian just, just uh, last week um, about so the uh, long COVID SOS group who've, who've been looking at the difference. Uh, there's been some anecdotal reports about people getting better or worse after vaccination with long COVID. And this is a particular area of interest, uh, I think, for many. And uh, the data that they reported from a survey was that uh, a sort of slight bias toward doing better to, to symptom improvement with the vaccine, of course, with many different potential mechanisms by which that could be occurring. So our team have summarised the neuropsychiatric data on long COVID, and this is a preprint that's just, just come out. Um, and uh, again, this is led by Jamie Badenock, uh, who unfortunately I haven't got a good picture of to put here, but I'll, I'll have to highlight him in the end in a minute. And th there isn't much high quality data. This is from a search in February, but again, they've moved very rapidly in getting this processed. So high rates, the highest rates are actually of sleep disorder, fatigue, depression, anxiety, uh, post-traumatic stressors, and then a, quite a range of other uh, neurological and neuropsychiatric uh, symptoms. So this is just one aspect of long COVID, uh, but one that we're, in my field, we're particularly interested in. Um, so very briefly to touch on the vaccine complications that I mentioned, um, we're all aware of the initial systemic reactions, and then the concerns about thromboembolism, uh, particularly resulting in PE, of course. Um, but the neurological data is, 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 is quite mixed so far, um, and no, no clear uh, relationships, uh, and the data from trials has really shown in both arms, so control and active vaccine, that there might be some uh, some signal, um, uh, whether it's Bell's palsy or transverse myelitis, which led to the AstraZeneca vaccine trial being paused temporarily until they concluded there was no causal association, and potentially some other disorders as well. Um, and because one of the disorders I particularly specialise in is functional neurological disorder, which is where uh, neuro severe neurological symptoms are caused by different sort of cognitive and sometimes psychological processes, I was interested in this angle as well. Uh, and we've seen a couple of patients, both in the and with colleagues in the US. We've got we're about to publish 
case reports of two cases of functional neurological disorder presenting with severe movement disorders. Um, and it, it raises extra levels of complexity in terms of defining uh, ca uh, uh, causality from association. And this preprint by Matt Butler tackles that complex issue uh, as well and provides some advice on that. So I think I'll just finish with that, thanking the, current, the amazing Coronav team, uh, the, the Coronav psychiatry team, and the blog team. And we're out, always looking out for new recruits, both nationally and internationally at all levels, from junior to senior, to join us. And this is Jamie, who led on the meta-analysis as well. So, and this is a, a social we had in uh, last autumn, uh, pre-second lockdown. Um, so hopefully we can all start to have more of those again in the future. So there are some more resources I can put in the chat later on. Thanks for your attention. Well, Tim, thank you very much. And once again, a very clear presentation of what's a very complex area. You mentioned confusion being pretty common as an early observation, perhaps in up to a quarter of patients. There are two elements to that. One, one is the obvious metabolic chaos, hypoxic people, maybe some kidney impairment. Um, to what extent um, is that confusion, which is explicable on those features, which resolves when people say are out of the ITU or severe respiratory support setting, as opposed to perhaps other mechanisms, inflammatory mechanisms linked to the virus for, for the early confusion? From my perspective, I think it's uh, it's very likely to be multifactorial and you have to look for multiple, you know, the, as you've already highlighted, there's, there's several common reasons why that could happen. And of course, steroids are another, uh, another reason people might uh, get confusion as well. Um, so, so I think um, it, uh, my, my hunch is, and I'm not sure how much sort of clear evidence we have for it yet, is that, it's, that all of those factors are relevant, but I think there is something quite relat uh, relatively uh, sort of, uh, large effect of this, this virus stimulating the, uh, the innate immune, immune system to cause this inflammatory storm, which I think causes uh, initial confusion and brain fog. And it's obviously you're, if you've got a, a more elderly brain with sort of um, mild cognitive impairment, you're likely this is likely to happen, but they're still happening quite a lot in younger populations as well. And um, I just saw a in fact, a, a patient in clinic who uh, was telling me just about how uh, ex describing their delirium and, and, and he'd interestingly had delirium in the context of other infections whilst quite young as well. So there's there's lots of interesting ways we can start to study this. And perhaps this is, again, one of the silver linings of this pandemic that we can start to unpick this complex disorder a bit more. So I don't know if you've got anything to add to that. Ben. So ben, any further comments on this question of confusion, early metabolic issues as opposed to other inflammatory or other mechanisms? Um, yeah, no, I, I, I agree with what you said. So we clearly have people who, who decompensate, um, who, who maybe have got mild cognitive impairment and in five to ten years' time may have turned out to have a, a dementia syndrome who, who manifest with delirium and encephalopathy as a consequence of that. We've also got people who are just simply hypoxic and hyponatremic and, and on a, a bucket load of drugs, which have caused them to be encephalopathic. Um, but interestingly, beyond that, there are a group of patients uh, that we are preferentially studying within the COVID CNS study who um, who have an encephalopathy which is more severe or more prolonged uh, than one would anticipate based on their purely their peripheral physiological markers um, and and quite whether that's microvascular or leukoencephalopathy or, or quite what that is um, really is uh, of, of great interest and you know as as Tim mentions the silver lining uh, of this awful pandemic is that we actually have the numbers now we can actually study this because this isn't new, we saw this with SARS, we saw it with MERS, we saw it with H1N1 as I began my presentation, but we never had numbers within which to actually study pathophysiology, but now we do. Thank you very much, Tim and Ben, on that point. Uh, picking up on a question from, from the chat, and this is about dementia. I, I think, Tim, you showed a slide. The, the numbers were quite small, so my recollection was perhaps 0.8%, that's to say 1 in 120 over 200 days having dementia observed versus 160 so it may be a, a third more observed to be developing some dementia and the question of the chat is to what extent that there's confidence this is a real observation as opposed to perhaps a case mix if 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 bad COVID is particularly affecting severely ill older people with other risk factors is it really well adjusted for all these factors or is it what, how, how much confidence have you on this link between dementia and COVID-19? Uh, again, I'll have a first go, perhaps, and then Ben can chip in. But I think um, I don't think I think we're one hundred percent confident. I think it's just uh, I think the it's just seeing the evolution in in uh, 
of our knowledge uh, and that we have these different bits of data coming in from surveillance studies, from epidemiological studies. Uh, and I think it's it's the studies like the one Ben's leading on that can perhaps start to answer this question where we can, we've got large uh, case control studies that can actually look at the mechanism and start to unpick what may or may not be not happening at the mechanistic level. So unless we've got huge epidemiological sort of data to back up what seems overwhelmingly some sort of link, then I think we need these mechanistic studies to really unpick exactly what's going on. So I think it's just early days, but I think these other studies start to give us clues as where we should, where we should focus our minds to look. Uh, so I don't know if you've got anything to add to that, Ben. No, just to say that if a sufficiently large denominator of people are infected, then due to your pre-infection risk factors, be they genetic or other, um, there is a proportion that even relatively rare complications occur like you know <laughs> acute necrotizing encephalopathy or acute hem hemorrhagic leukoencephalopathy or acute disseminated encephalomyelitis you need to get many many tens of thousands of people infected before that relatively rare complication occurs um, and, and whilst that has cognitive complications and consequences um, that is nevertheless distinct from uh, cognitive symptoms and cognitive symptoms seem to be very, very common. Um, whereas these brain inflammatory um, and cerebrovascular disorders seem to be mercifully, uh, uh, relatively uh, uncommon. Now you, you touched on this very interesting observation about people on antidepressants apparently doing rather better. And there's a question here the other way around, are there any particular psychotropic drugs which uh, are perhaps um, contraindicated due to, due to their possible interactions in some way with what the COVID might do to the brain i'm not aware, aware of any particular i'm not sure if, if ben's uh, noticed anything um i guess what we we have noticed and there's probably a point to flag this up is the high rates of um morbidity and mortality amongst psychiatric patients so people with schizophrenia and other chronic severe mental illness um that uh, uh there's many factors why they might be uh, more uh, affected by covid um so i think that's uh, that could be medications they're on but I think there's obviously a huge number of other factors that that are at play within um, people with uh, chronic severe mental illness as well so I think that's probably just using that question to to sort of make a plea for the for for greater care for 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 the chronic severe mental illness patients. Another question in the chat I think you touched on this earlier um, Ben um, it was the question of anti anticoagulants or antiplatelet agents and prophylaxis and there's a question here about whether low-dose aspirin, whether signals to, to have been precursor to the study that's happening formally about using aspirin to protect patients? Yeah, it's an important question. I mean, it, as you say, I've, I've largely answered it before, but no, there's no signal thus far that low-dose aspirin is in some way preventative. Um, and, and, and to that point, actually, um, uh, it, it feeds into Tim's last answer, which is that uh, we've seen many patients with existing uh, neurological or psychiatric disease do much, much worse with COVID, as well as those on antidepressants doing better. Um, so actually, uh, what we might be seeing is uh, that phenomena where men uh, tend to last longer if they're married, and it's just because their wives make sure they look after themselves. And it might be those on antidepressants, uh, for example, are those more engaged with the healthcare service, uh, for example, uh, than others. And it, it, these might be epiphenomena rather than having a kind of mechanistic interaction between the SARS-CoV-2 infection and their brain complications. And going back to this question of psychotropics, there's a, there's a specific, very specific question here, which may not be have an answer as yet, and that's the extent to which any beneficial effect of antidepressants may be due to some interaction level of the astrocyte. Is, is that is that known? Yeah, so we're, we're looking at that currently. So um, we've got some evidence from postmortem studies that there's astrobiotic uh, change and there's astrocyte. Uh, and particularly uh, microglial nodules of, of activated ramified microglia co-localizing with astrocytes, which may have a role at the blood-brain barrier interface, uh, but really you are at the very, very early phases of, of understanding the role of astrocytes and microglia uh, on the brain uh, in the context of COVID. Perhaps worth also asking Tim the question I asked Ben earlier, and that's to say, we're now fortunately in the era of having vaccines available and an obvious question is to what extent the psychiatric effects of, of COVID are linked to presence of the virus as opposed to severity of the disease caused by the virus. 
And you were saying, Ben, that the neurological side of things seems much improved, the frequency seems much reduced um, since vaccines have become available. Is, is that information available as yet on the psychiatric side of things, Tim? Uh, I don't think so. I think, as you've seen from the data, we have sort of smaller numbers uh, of those types of presentations. So I, I, I suspect we, we can't say really any more than, than and, and I think also, again, the great thing about this is it, this the work here is we, you know, it's, it's quite hard to separate psychiatric from neurological. So, of course, the two things are entwined. Um, so I think I suspect I wouldn't suspect that we would see something different potentially. I just I think that uh, the neurological have psychiatric complications and the psychiatric things have the neurological underpinning <laughs> often. Yeah. So uh, the distinction, uh, I think yeah, COVID has taught us a lot. And if, it, if it's taught us anything, it's uh, that uh, the brain mind interface is something that needs to have a, a, a tri pronged attack to the psychological, the psychiatric, and the neurological. One further question from the chat. It, perhaps you, Ben, could you comment on the question of ticks, development of ticks, and whether this happens in children? And, and there's, there's this comment here about Tourette's kind of syndromes. So are they being observed in, more generally in, in adults or children as complications? Yes, I'll obviously, say no specific advice, but. Um, we, we haven't, through the National Surveillance Network, received um, large numbers of, of people presenting with, uh, or doctors with patients uh, presenting with, with a tick disorder. I think the post-infectious tick phenomena has been uh, has been described for a long time, uh, but, it, but it's certainly a complex one and one that requires a lot of further work. Again, I know you touched on this question of epilepsy already, but what about focal seizures? Is it much known about whether they are any commoner? In any of the age groups? Yeah, so we, we we have at least seen, I mean, we don't yet know that we replicated the, the European study and the American studies are not yet published, but the UK one, which was the first one out, um, we did report a small number, but a severely affected younger group of patients with acute onset status epilepticus, including um, focal motor seizures and non-convulsive status epilepticus in the, top, in the context of COVID infection. And there have been a handful of case reports where they've identified a specific autoantibody directed to a CNS epitope. Uh, as I mentioned, the LGI-1 or the NMDAR receptor autoantibodies have been described. Um, so yes, I think it seems to be rare, but yes, it does. There at least is a temporal association between COVID uh, and the development of autoantibodies, which can drive focal seizures. Well, thank you, Ben. Are there any final points you wanted to make, Tim? No, to say thank you for inviting us. And um, I think it, you know, so I think the the great thing about about this uh, this horrible situation is that we've got some focus to hopefully address some complex issues around. Uh, brain disorders and uh, it's it's just been it's been very great and energizing having the whole new clinical neuroscience and academic neuroscience communities working together to hopefully answer um, problems which might have ramifications beyond just this pandemic in terms of understanding uh, brain disease. Just to build on that and say that you know questions around the role of pandemic infection and its impact on the brain and the mind have been with us for a hundred years if not many hundreds of years uh, and uh, now, because we are a genuinely a globally connected uh, network, not just working across the neurosciences, of course, which is important, but of course, working with our colleagues around the world, we really do have genuinely mankind's first opportunity to understand uh, what this means at the brain-mind interface. And also, of course, to thank uh, FPM for the invite. Well, on behalf of the Fellowship of Postgraduate Medicine, I'm really very happy to thank both of you for two tremendous talks i think it's been very clear it's really early days although this has been around for a year or so it really takes a long time to to develop the enough information to be clear on mechanisms but also think about treatments and i think there's going to be a lot of scope for a further one of these sessions um in in some months time just considering what more is known with larger data sets about causes or possible causes and again to be begin to get some idea about what treatments might become available for both the neurological side of things as well as psychiatric and what, what the outcomes might be from these. Um, this is one of a series of webinars from our organisation. Do come back and join us at future events. We will send you links so you're clear what's coming up next. Uh, specifically, we do uh, plan a third conference this year looking at advances in medicine across areas from uh, brain to heart to other areas. Um, because of COVID times, we're running these as a series of five webinars with expert panels monthly from end of July, but also with the opportunity for you as audience to send in your own work and will they be peer reviewed and opportunity for some of those to be presented at the end of the panel and then published in one of our two journals. Um, as, as a final note, some of you are keen on the idea of having
certificates for joining us. We are very keen to, to let you have those, but they're conditioned on you giving some feedback. So we will be sending you some feedback forms. Do you tell us what you thought of our talks, the topics uh, and our speakers, and also let us know what you learned today and what you, you would like to hear more about at future sessions. Finally, on your behalf, a big thank you to our two speakers, Dr. Ben Michael from the University of Liverpool and Dr. Tim Nicholson from King's College London.